Hello and welcome to the 130th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Saturday the 15th of August 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. Today we have part two of our interview with Professor Issa Blumi, Professor of Turkish and Middle Eastern Studies at Stockholm University, about his 2018 book Destroying Yemen, What Chaos in Arabia Tells Us About the World. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. Can you talk for a minute about Al Hamdi? He put into place, I think, these things called LDAs. So these are local development associations. Can you talk about what their role was and and the power of that? So northern Yemen, uh, very agriculturally, very rich, had a growing population, which eventually would translate into tensions over use of land. And we're at the beginning of the era of the of the expansionist UN as a UN aid agencies and the, the role of, let's say, direct aid coming from countries like the United States through the USAID. They're beginning to infiltrate these newly independent third world countries. While North Yemen, Yemen had always been remained an in, independent sovereign state, the last one that was not occupied by European capitalist powers uh, and would remain so until the 1970s. It nevertheless needed to manage its relationship with the larger world that had become more sophisticated in intervening and imposing economic relations that would continue to serve the interest of global capital, whether it be the city of London or Wall Street. And Northern Yemenis were very sophisticated. They had, whether or not you can say it, successfully thwarted through this endless civil war in the 1960s, thwarted the penetration of European American capitalism in the early 70s, by 74, 75, because demographically Yemenis had an excess of population, you begin to see an oil boom translate into new demand for labor that Yemenis would be able to provide in large amounts, which would immediately translate into a huge influx of Saudi rials and uh, hard currency, even though the civil war in Yemen had led to a transformation of the economic financial system within Yemen. It would be forced to adopt a central bank, first courtesy of Nasser. Egypt imposed the creation of a central bank, imposed the printing of of a currency, a paper currency. Yemenis remained very astutely hesitant to being integrated into this new modern financial system through banking, which had branch offices throughout the, the country already by the end of the 1960s. And they kept their money at home. They didn't contribute to the, let's say, internal wealth accumulation of Yemen that, as elsewhere, translated in transfer of that wealth to global markets in one shape or form, whether it be in buying expensive equipment, modern guns or factories or whatever. Yemenis did not surrender their wealth, their their savings to the central bank of Yemen, which was already under the control of global capitalist interests outside the country. And this was a long-term frustration. It was understood by the early 1970s with these advisors that are being sent from the UN who were purely cover for American and European financial interests, who were trying to advise this new coalition government that had emerged out of the civil war. You need to adopt certain kinds of policies in managing your money. You need to force and compel Yemenis to put their hard-earned savings, the money that their children are making in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or elsewhere in the larger world, that money should be properly secured in banks. And the problem is is that it it would have been politically impossible to enforce this. And so when Hamdi comes to power, He's a very sophisticated man, educated man. He understands how this global financial system works. And he's figured out a new way to avoid the kind of pressure that was happening elsewhere, where UN was offering money from the via World Bank or IMF or direct aid from the United States in return for certain kinds of structural reform. He said, no, we have an alternative here. I can get my workers, Yemeni workers, to pool their resources to take care of their communities as they know best. I can encourage them to put money in these LDAs. So they're basically kind of savings and loans and savings banks that are autonomous from the central Yemeni bank. 
meaning it's autonomous from the global financial system still. And people are putting their money into enterprises that service the interests of the local community. It is not contributing to Yemen's integration into the global economy, meaning Yemen's wealth is still remaining within Yemen, which is contrary to the long-term strategic interests of global capitalists and of those bureaucrats who are being trained slowly but surely in University of Arizona or Illinois State or in some, some place in Britain. Coming back with the idea that uh, in order for us to be a modern society, we need to integrate our institutions. We need to stream our institutions just like UN advisors are suggesting we do. So there's a clash of cultures until Hamdi is removed from power violently. They try to set him up, make him look like some buffoon, uh, unfortunate for two French models. Their dead bodies were placed next to his own, next to caskets of whiskey. They tried a public relations campaign to completely ruin this guy's reputation because he was a very much loved guy. He was very much supported by large segments of Yemeni society. And until today, if you go to Sana'a, revolutionary Sana'a trying to stop this war, stop the Americans and the Saudis from occupying their lands, they have all these images around them. They're, they're notorious declarations that there's no God by God and that the Americans and the Israelis are evil. There's also pictures of Che Guevara and Hamdi. He's that kind of character. He's that kind of person with that kind of ideological, methodological credentials as Che Guevara and of revolutionary Muslim leaders. So people understood that even though he would be, he would, there would be all kinds of campaigns to ruin his reputation, he, his name would be removed once Ali Abdullah Saleh would take power in 1978. His statues would be removed. His name would be removed from records. There would be no chance to talk about him in schools. People forgot about him, supposedly. But people in, in northern Yemen in particular are very good at keeping things orally intact. They have still the freedom to talk amongst themselves. And they continue to maintain this memory, if you will, of a different time when Yemen still was thriving. This was a boom time in Yemeni economy. People were, were living well. They were investing in their own communities. The farmlands were expanding. They were bringing in new techniques that were not pushed by U USAID, which had a whole different agenda for Yemeni, Yemeni agriculture, which is to move away from self-sufficiency. Why don't you produce cash crops that our markets in the West can buy? You know, and unfortunately, with Ali Abdullah Saleh taking power in northern Yemen, he would eventually start pushing for precisely this. The Yemen by the time it's unified, is a net importer of food, which is uh, ridiculous. And by the 2015, it's importing 90% of all its food is consumed. It's, it's importing 90% of it. 90%. So like, what are they producing agriculturally then, if, if they're importing that amount of food? Cash crops. Like? Uh, well, coffee, They were the Americans' uh, experts were coming from the USAID and pushing yucca trees, and they were, they were experimenting with large... They would, they, would have, they would have access to these uh, very rich valleys, and they would basically clear out the agricultural production of these valleys and introduce alien plants to see how they could be commercially exploited. And eventually, many of these farmers elected to start producing cut, the drug that was of high demand, it absorbs huge amounts of water. And because farmers had to basically, they are now in a cash-based economy, which was directly linked to the larger global economy, they had to pr constantly produce revenues that would produce cash, would translate into cash to maintain their accounts. And, and so you see the, the, the same story all over the so-called third world. Consolidation of land around, small, about around a small cluster of landed elites. The large number of people are now uprooted from their lands. They no longer can feed themselves. They have to avail themselves for even cheaper means as cheap labor in, in the Gulf in other parts of the world, or as cheap labor for these now cash crop fields. And so the most lucrative of all businesses was this drug that everyone's just started to chew by the mid-1980s, late early 1990s. It expands into southern Yemen, where they did never ate this, and it became a disaster that was in many ways designed to play itself out in this way. Yemen became dependent on American wheat imports. I meaning in order to pay for these imports, they would have to generate somehow money. 
most often the case, they, they couldn't do that other than sell their, their oil, potential oil, for, for very cheap. And Ali Abdullah Saleh would uh, help implement that. George Bush Sr. Uh, had a very notorious visit in the mid-1980s when he was still vice president of the United States, coming down representing an Oklahoma-based oil company, signing the first big contract that eventually had its eyes on southern Yemen, which was at that stage a very independent socialist communist state that had lost its main supporter with Gorbachev coming to power. It didn't have the revenue to produce its oil wealth. It had lots of oil reserves that needed to be, however, tapped into, which required large capital investments, which by that time in 1985, 86, oil was at $10, $12 a barrel. Nobody wanted to invest in oil anymore. And in, in comes George Bush Sr. with his guy, the Hunt Oil Company, signing agreements with Ali Abdullah Saleh in northern Yemen. In that same year, you have a revolution or a coup, uh, a change of power in southern Yemen, which initiates the process of a negotiation for unification. And then all of these areas of central Yemen, which has all this natural gas and all this oil, petroleum, which they knew already in the 1930s was there, was going to now be accessible for super cheap because both Yemen, North Yemen and South Yemen are desperate for money, desperate for uh, a new opportunity in the world. And it so happens that by 1990s, the, the crisis with Saddam Hussein takes place. Yemen, a now unified country with a lot of these guys who had been fighting the Cold War on the right side, as many of us think, putting pressure on, on, on the now unified Yemen, making an alliance with Saddam Hussein, making an alliance with Jordan, very interesting enough. All the three countries would be punished for this alliance, of course, with the, it's now the anniversary of the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq's f- forces in 1991, I believe. All of this plays itself out where Yemen becomes susceptible to outside pressure that a generation earlier had been able to stave off because they were agriculturally independent, because they were impervious to military pressure. There was no way that anybody was going to ever, ever invade northern Yemen. That was an impossible impossibility. And they were sophisticated cosmopolitan types. They were able to navigate and negotiate balance off competing powers for influence in, in North Yemen. That all goes with the death of Hamdi, the arrival of Ali Abdul Salah, and his incremental integration into the global economy, which by the 1980s is driven by Reaganomics, Thatcher's economy, cheap money. And we know the story from, from then on, globally at least. Salah was the man then, they had their man, and he introduced all these neoliberal reforms, selling off all of state assets one after another. And, and you see that as the root cause of the, what, what is called in the West the Houthis now. Can you explain to us what, what are called the Houthis now? What is their social base in Yemen and how that played into what Salah has been up to for the last 30 years he was up to? After the uh, agreement to unify the two countries, it, it was be based on a parliamentary system. And in Yemen did have very free elections in 1993. And that would be uh, uh, reversed. The consequences of that election, where power was very much distributed equally in a number of areas, uh, would be reversed with the uh, war of 1994, which saw northern Yemen de facto occupying southern Yemen and transforming forever the relationship northern Yemen had with South Yemen. So basically it would be Ali Abdullah's alliance uh, that was often very with strong connections to either Saudi Arabia, later on to Qatar, so say conservative Islamist elements that would be during the contest over Afghanistan in the Cold War with the mobilization of political Islam as a tool to mobilize, to recruit Many, many Yemenis ended up fighting on behalf of the CIA and the Pakistani security services in Afghanistan. It created a a significant body of of able-bodied men who were now available to put pressure politically anywhere in the larger Islamic world and, as we see, even in some parts of Western Africa today. This would be a useful um, asset to Ali Abdullah Salah's expanding ambitions that became quite clear, I think, to the people around them that they can actually make big power grabs with the use of violence, 
the use of this new kind of uh, opportunity of free money from the IMF. Clearly, the IMF was making loans on basis that certain policies would be introduced in Yemen. The precursor to violence and to pushing aside the constitution and persecuting political opponents were always in, in quiet ways supported by the American embassy, the British embassy, because they were pursuing global, global reforms, reforms that were embraced by the markets, if you will. And one of the primary victims of this would be the region that had long been secure, agriculturally speaking, independent politically, and spiritually uh, remained very much an extension of the previous uh, generations. This area is what we would call Saada. It's a province called Saada, and it extends from Sana'a, the capital, northwards, all the way into uh, the borderlands of, with Saudi Arabia and into Saudi Arabia itself, because they, they basically are related to each other, the peoples on both sides of the border. The border was never really delineated until 2000. And so people right. were allowed to travel back and forth. The Saudis had no means to control this. They actually benefited from the commerce. Much of the food that was feeding southwestern parts of, of Saudi Arabia was coming from northern Yemen, this part of northern Yemen. So everyone was benefiting from the fact that there was really not a boundary between these Yemens, right? And unfortunately, when this power grabs takes place in Sana'a, it results in a very principled stand by politicians, members representing their, their regions in parliament. And one of them became quite famous, well-spoken, very articulate, with the name of, a family name of Houthi, of this town and this constituency called Houthi in, nor in this northern region of Yemen. He ultimately leaves Sana'a and, and then basically drawing from these principles of traditions, if you will, of resisting injustice, and ad addressing unjust use of power by the state, initiated a campaign to reform the government, removed Ali Abdullah Saleh and his General People's Congress, his party, that is a big umbrella organization, if you will, that brings in all the crooks of Yemen together. The current recognized leader was Ali Abdullah Saleh's vice president, never a rival, this Hadi guy, who's now living in Saudi Arabia, supposedly representing Yemen to the larger world. They, they are all part of this larger umbrella organization called the General People's Congress. So among many places, the South, the, those who remember just several years ago, they were an independent Marxist state that had a very powerful military and had all the potential to becoming a major oil producer. They had this huge coastline. They, had, they know they had offshore oil, uh, gas resources. Why are they suddenly now impoverished, persecuted? They too were reacting negatively, and that led to this war in 94. So more or less, this is a process taking, it's taking place also in the North. But what really translates into collective reaction, and this is where I get to the constituency that makes up this initial Houthi phenomena, which is really not one based on one spiritual leader, but it's been phrased that way by the outside world, by so-called experts of the region, they cut corners to basically label this in a derogatory way towards this fanaticism around this one individual. And yes, members of his extended family would continue to be the symbolic leaders of some of these factions. But this is a much broader coalition that extends well beyond the communities that had, for familial reasons or for commercial reasons, had alliances with this family called Houthi. It extends all the way into southern parts of what today is Saudi Arabia, the, those Yemeni parts. It extends deep into the mountains of the, of the western and eastern provinces. Why? Because all the people who are now supposedly Houthis, even though, again, they don't have any familial connections, they even have probably very stark spiritual differences or interpretations of, of spiritual questions, they have a common cause. They are like what should have been the working class fighting against global capitalism in the industrial world and how that started to fragment. No, they, their ideas was actually, even though we are different and we have very different, supposedly very different reasons for resisting the, the Salah state, resisting global capitalism, that actually unifies us, despite the fact that we are of different religious sects or of different so-called tribes, all those things that supposedly divide the Arab world amongst themselves. And it's quite f important for us to put it in those ways to, that, in fact, people are able to organize across very, very stark categories of, of distinction 
that often gets sold to us in the scholarship and the think tanks in the West. Like the Houthis are sold to Joe Public as they're sold as a, a Shia sect, essentially, and an Iranian controlled Shia sect. When you read the history, it seems, you know, the, the scholarship, it seems like not just crude, but just plain goddamn wrong. You know what I mean? Well, obviously, it's uh, it's a narrative of convenience. It pits uh, the Saudi uh, coalition, the Americans, with, who all see and wants to justify the brutal the brutal suppression of these eighteen to twenty million people in northern Yemen, makes it much easier for them to sell and justify it as if it links them to this Shia Sunni kind of binary. Unfortunately, if one all has to do is look at some of the basics histories of northern Yemen and what makes Zaidi she is very distinctive. It makes it quite clear that you cannot make this correlation. But that goes out the window with the new dynamics uh, after 2015. And indeed, the connection with the larger is Islamic world via Shia Sunni rivalries does not in any ways explain what's happening on the ground in Yemen, why these people are able to resist since the middle of the 1990s, in fact is that one, they're all heavily armed. Yemen was the country where I could, I remember going there the first time and going to this area, and they were actually selling anti-aircraft uh, weapons on flat, flatbed trucks. You can actually go to the market and buy, you know, these, these anti-aircraft. Uh, what, uh, year? what year are you talking, Isa? 1993. God. Uh, Kalashnikovs were very cheap. And this, over the long term, was a problem for Saudi Arabia because these weapons were infiltrating into a very open, porous border. And eventually, the politics of Yemeni nationalism, the respect for the past, the, re the memory of Yemeni autonomy or independence from the global capitalist world was translating to we can actually unify our peoples on both sides of the border. And this would translate into big problems for the Americans, for oil industry, obviously for the Saud family itself. And uh, Ali Abdel Salah became necessarily one that was promoting much more aggressive approach to dealing with local politics. Traditionally, it would be foolhardy and stupid and suicidal to decide to go at war with fellow Yemenis. You would never want to induce chaos. And this is, was the thesis of my first book on Yemen, was that Ali Abdullah Saleh and others were actually inducing a chaotic kind of situation that would basically force rhetorically the hand of support from the outside world. Yes, we will allow you, we will look the other way as you continue to use more sophisticated weapons, aerial bombardment against rebels in the north, against Islamic fundamentalists in the south, against neo-Marxists and, and others. And so you had this kind of move towards away from politics to violence. You can see this all over the world, by the way, at this stage. In late, late 2009, 8, 9, 10, chaos is the kind of method, if you will, in the, in the Middle East. And it's not by mistake that the beneficiaries of that chaos would be the United States, Israel, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's easier to extract wealth when you have no state and no, no power. They prefer a lack of power and pure, like, crazy anarchy, slave trading in Libya than a strong state that can, can hold on to some of the surplus. Can, can you, you mentioned the book, I think, somewhere, maybe it was in a footnote about the role that Obama's drone strikes in Yemen were playing for eliminating what was supposed to be Al-Qaeda. And I was wondering if you could link that as well into the, the role that these Takfiri elements actually play on the ground in the, as a kind of an armed force for empire. One, there, were, uh, there was always, uh, from the late 1990s onwards, um, American boots on the ground in Yemen. We know from those notorious examples of ships being attacked and uh, sold USS Cole uh, was one example. There were always periodic assassinations of American agents on the streets of Sana'a or elsewhere. They were very much involved uh, with the recruitment of Yemenis to go and fight during the war in Afghanistan. So the, the, the infrastructure had already been laid out in that period. And this would simply extend and expand under the first of George W. Bush, under Clinton's, in fact. Clinton's expansion of uh, exploitation of political Islam is understudied still. This is a neo-colonial kind of enterprise that is basically an extension of old imperialist tactics using violence uh, against, using Islam against Muslims, uh, uh, Muslims and resistance. This is how I phrase it. And uh, this was certainly the case in, in, throughout Yemen.
and with a great deal of local domestic frustrations and, and resentment. And there was a recognition that Ali Abdullah Saleh was using these elements that were often being trained in the country, sent off to destabilize other countries, and who would come back and, when necessary, be used to deal with domestic issues. Uh, the war in 1994 was largely uh, won not with, say, the, the Yemeni uh, Republican army, but with these, these militias, these mercenaries, who had proven to be very effective in very, very different contexts. One, because Yemenis, when they fight each other, they have certain decorum. They, have certain, they understand very well, you don't touch women, you don't burn down the houses of, of the, your adversary. Most likely, they're going to be your ally next year. So something had to change with that kind of approach. And Yemeni politics always, there was always, the first resort was negotiate. Maybe you kidnap some guy. I remember traveling throughout Yemen and there were always villages would have blocks. They would stop the cars and they would charge you a little money and also see if they would be someone they can actually arrest for a while in order to negotiate for a new pipe system or a new school or something. This was f very famous. Yemen was very famous for this kind of politics. So Ali Abdullah Saleh was expected to erase this, to eradicate this. And you couldn't have this with Yemenis who have a s links to families. The Yemenis who were being kicked out, however, during the first Gulf War with Saddam Hussein, the million plus people who were deported from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, especially from Qatar, many of them were actually gone to school and had been indoctrinated in Saudi Arabia uh, with Wahhabism. So they came back now penniless in this is now again 1990 91 92 they had already been hearing that their job opportunities but if you want to go get training and go to some military base somewhere in the desert of, of central yemen and then you can go on fights and make a thousand dollars a month or something like that overseas so there was already an economy with this now influx of desperate young men who have already a very alien idea of what islam represents and there are on the ground now, thanks to Ali Abdullah Saleh's uh, infrastructure, men who will f facilitate the continuation of this indoctrination. So you begin to see this clash of cultures, old traditional Yemeni religious beliefs and behavior amongst themselves. And these, these guys who are growing beards, who are forcing their women to be cover completely covered up, to isolate themselves from the larger community, no longer seeing that their Yemeni neighbors are people that they should respect. And so you see a divide in society, and that allows them to bring violence to these communities in ways that did not exist in the past. So it's a very different kind of intra-Yemeni war going on now. You have a portion of the population who will rape and pillage and kill Yemenis, not just simply arrest them and then let them go or sell them you know, for freedom for five bucks or a pack of cigarettes as it was in the past. And so that's a dramatically different kind of Yemen. And all those anthropologists who went and studied Yemen in the 1980s with U.S. grants, who studied Arabic language in Sana'a or elsewhere, some of them, unfortunately, brought back their skill sets, brought back the friendships they made, and served empire. And that's to me, is the saddest uh, story of it all, is that the insinuation of empire in through all kinds of channels that we don't suspect were at play, but they were clearly, and I can see it, I can smell it, I could feel it happening as I was spending my early and later adult life in Yemen, watching it progressively transform and seeing who's coming through. And I was quite sensitive to this by my own experiences in the Balkans, which is a whole different story. So I, I've, I've been able to ask the right kinds of questions, and people on the, on the ground in Yemen understood what was going on. And wh why this narrative is, and why this critique of Yemen's relationship with the West, starting out with Clintons, starting out then with George W. Bush, and then with Obama, who mastered the use of the drones. The drones would be used to take out not Daesh or, or ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but political opponents of Ali Abdullah Saleh are political threats to those that the U.S. Embassy determined to be key allies in areas under dispute. So you really began to see a dramatic shift of balance of power where through American use of drones, killing arbitrarily large swaths of people, developing this double tap technique, which is horrible, so immoral. 
which was under the Obama administration, where you bomb first initially, knowing that people will come and try to protect and save and, and rescue people who are injured, hit that th site again. And they continuously use this tactic till today. And, and this was under the Obama administration. And more importantly, the, the circle of people around him, Susan Rice, the Clintons, who have very strong relations with Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood, which is something that uh, is toxic discussions right now in, in the United States, especially during the elections, right, where there's a whole different phenomena going on now. A anything but Trump is the kind of narrative now in much of the Western world, and it's made it impossible for us to actually look more closely at what the evolution of American empire, of capitalist empire, how it translates on the ground in a place like Yemen, and how it, it developed techniques that would then be expanded elsewhere in the world. And we, which you can see prevalent throughout Western Africa, Central Africa, and the whole nonsense that happened in Eastern Congo, uh, these horrible genocides in that period, I would suggest has interesting links, at least with personalities who were involved in Southern Arabia, who then brought that nonsense, that evilness to Central, Central Africa as well. And they're all, they're all armed with this so-called knowledge from the university, from, from anthropological knowledge or knowledge of, of, through sociology or political science. And that side of it has to be addressed. So-called expertise has translated as another tool, a layer of empire, and it has produced horrible consequences in a place like Yemen. It's not just the economists. <laughs> it's, no. So what is the situation on the ground? The very opening, I think, chapter of your book, there's a proverb I like to... I really like it. It's the not the introduction, but the chapter you say, yeah, Yemen is deadly, I think, is, <laughs> is, the, is a regional proverb. Like at the moment, uh, we see a weakening of, I think, you know, the actual proper weakening of US hegemony. We're seeing like ruptures. The coronavirus has laid bare a lot of stuff. The current economic crisis, political crisis in America is deep, showing the kind of uh, bare belly of the underside or whatever we call it of the of US empire. In the, in the end of one of the, I think your final chapter or the coda, you talk about how the contradictions in Yemen and this war is going to lay bare the contradictions in the relationships between empire and Saudi Arabia. What are your thoughts on it now, given what we've seen in the last year or two since you've read the book? Uh, well, Clearly, one of the main uh, factors pushing for a military, quick military victory in 2015 were the, I think it was already evident then, a uh, financial catastrophe awaiting not only uh, Saudi Arabia, which was uh, already operating on a bankruptcy, a trajectory of bankruptcy that needed to be addressed uh, with political violence, which we saw with the rise of Mohammed bin Salman and, and then indeed this war. But the global economy was... 2008, 2009, which is a precursor to what happened in February and March of this year, which has been neatly um, kind of submerged by the larger COVID narrative. But uh, the, the region itself had to be readjusted. The scramble for available capital for savings that it was, short, it was drying up, the speculative economies of Dubai, for instance, that was something that Saudi Arabia saw as a model for its own kind of shift away from dependency on oil that was heavily was over leveraged. It was very expensive to maintain a system. Qaddafi's kind of experiment that initiated this whole oil boom in the early 70s had come to an end. The, the dollar based economy, which uh, the, the OPEC countries helped sustain, was no longer sustainable. There was the rise of the BRICS. Uh, the rise of China and Russia as a possible alternative to North and Atlantic power, financial power. So there were adjustments that were being made. And so, whether or not Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and UAE, the two, three big players in the region, were going to survive that, uh, required that they had they were secure uh, access to larger assets, areas that were yet untapped wealth. Property development was in small ways already happening in Sana'a, in Aden, in other areas of Yemen prior to 2014, 2015. This is one of the reasons why Yemenis in large amounts were already revolting in 2011. In the interim period from 2011, 12 to the war itself, Yemenis were seeing that this interim government of Hadi, who was imposed by the Americans, um, who was still identified as the legitimate leader 
by this coalition today was on speed dial, rapidly integrating Yemen into the World Trade Organization, allocating uh, its resources for the, the lowest bidder in some cases, ripping up previous contracts. Dubai Ports World, which had contracts for most of the ports of, of Yemen, the, their contracts were ripped up and there were new bids to Qatari and Saudi companies. So this was a kind of a power grab within a larger region that was running very quickly out of revenue resources. Yemen, its fisheries, its offshore oil and gas would promise whoever would be able to acquire this region long-term, let's say, collateral for continuous influx of debt. They, they were not bar able to borrow money anymore. All these countries were basically being warned that you're going to have to find new resources. Saudi Arabia's oil resor reservoirs are far, far more depleted than as is spoken about in public. It's kind of a national secret that cannot be divulged, but they're now taxing people. Uh, the value-added tax, they've tripled it over the last couple of years. They haven't been paying bills. Big companies like the Bin Laden Group have gone out of business. You go around Saudi Arabia, you can see unfinished projects, big development projects that are unfinished. And that's now across the region. And that's large part not because of the war. The war itself was a, a possible quick solution to that short-term need for, our, for assets. The problem is that they didn't learn from history. Yemenis are not going to surrender their assets like this. They're not going to succumb to this kind of bullying. And upwards of 20 million people have been remaining resilient despite the, the, the brutal, brutal use of these of tactics that are not only military, Often they cannot use direct confrontation. Their, their, their mercenaries fail constantly to defeating militarily. They use starvation. They use denying access to the outside world. This part of Yemen has been closed off from the rest of the world since 2015. The United Nations, Medicine Sans Frontieres, other uh, so-called international organizations have been very complicit in this. They've constantly given the Saudi uh, family especially Mohammed bin Salman's faction of the Saudi family, benefit of the doubt. They have been advocates for the government that no one recognizes anymore. And in the meantime, this coalition, which was really a coalition out of necessity, it was one of three different competing f powers, breaks apart with the emergence of Trump. Trump pushes aside of the State Department, that was this neocon elements that were running the show, if you will, in Yemen. And it immediately exposes the, the rivalries between the three big players, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Qatar gets pushed aside and marginalized. They've been doing an, basically a cold war between these three countries ever since. It plays itself out in Yemen in very ugly terms. The factions that once formed, the, especially the Islamist faction, that formed the coalition, a very loose coalition at the beginning, has broken apart. So. Most of southern Yemen is basically a war zone between members of the coalition or militias of the coalition. And that has been playing itself out since 2015, 2016. They're fighting for like individual parts of the GCC are fighting for their own little uh, kind of assets that they can grab and, and maintain so they can get the revenues from like a certain port or a certain oil platform or something. Yeah, for, for a while, there was oil flowing, kind of like with Libya today, the eastern Libya. The problem is, is that it, it's very easy to sabotage. Most of the pipelines are above ground. And if one group doesn't like, they can easily just drive a car to the pipeline and, and blow it up. And so the, the oil is not flowing anymore. But there is certainly uh, infrastructure awaiting to be exploited. What, what is being exploited right now is access to uh, Yemen's offshore assets, especially fisheries. You have Spanish and Chinese, the usual suspects who are exploiting uh, the fact that there's no policing of Yemen's sovereign uh, waters. So there's a lot of plundering of Yemen's offshore assets. Right now, there's a big struggle over Socotra Island, which is this miraculous kind of unique e ecosystem in the middle of the Indian Ocean that is now being fought over between rivals within the coalition. I, I, my suspicion is that because this is a very costly war now, you have to pay these guys uh, thousands of dollars a month to, to maintain uh, some kind of presence in these vast territories. And they're being defeated. The, the Northern Alliance that makes up what is the, the resistance to this coalition, what are called the Houthis in the Western press, they inherited much of the Yemeni army, which was the largest army under Ali Abdullah Saleh. And most of the officers and most of the soldiers remained loyal to Yemen and stayed with this 
Houthi coalition after the war. We, even Ali Abdullah Saleh had to, out of necessity, form an alliance against the, the coalition. And he was ultimately killed in 2017, I believe, because he was trying to break free and join the Saudis and say, look, I'm now, I'm here to form a, an alliance to take over Sana'a. But the point is that the Yemeni military, which had 20, 30 years of access to Western technology, and had access to Soviets and then Russian technology and Chinese technology. They had built enormously elaborate tunnel systems around Sana'a throughout these mountains where they had missile systems. Much of the uh, Air Force was destroyed very quickly or stolen very quickly during this uh, initial phases of the war. But the officers, they know what they're doing. Their engineers know what they're doing. And they've been able to manipulate the military equipment that they have Every time they win a victory on the battlefield, which is very often because their adversaries are, are not motivated at all, they're just mercenaries. For a long time, the coalition had to bring in Sudanese soldiers and soldiers from Somaliland and elsewhere, and that, that didn't work out very well. So th they have very sophisticated drone systems of their own right. They've been able to shoot down a couple of drones and reverse engineer the technology, and they've been able to build their own. They have ballistic missiles that they've been able to fire f into Riyadh, which is a 1,000 kilometers away. And while they don't have many, they are able to occasionally remind their adversaries that they can bring a lot of pain and suffering to the countries themselves. And in the meantime, they've been incrementally, very sophisticated way, hitting this very loose coalition of the, of, that is based throughout southern Arabia which has led to political rivalries that extend to basically internecine war between the so-called coalition. It's impossible to maintain. You have basically two separate, maybe three separate governments competing against each other and exchanging Aden. There'll be a battle that goes on for about a week. Then one side is then replacing the other. Military bases are then pillaged, and then the other side takes over. So it's a mess. They'll never be able to win this war. And yet they cannot surrender this war because in the end, the ultimate long-term ambitions was to secure the assets of Yemen. So it's kind of an interesting paradox or quagmire where they can't actually end this war. They're trying to find cheap ways to ending it. They're trying to induce the Americans, which Trump is never going to um, throw American troops into this endless war. They tried to find other ways to get other actors to do the fighting. And they would get this, of course, to secure the financial rewards if they were to win, but they cannot. So this is a war that uh, they've been trying to starve the people in the submission in the north. They tried to uh, poison them, uh, disease, cholera, largest cholera outbreak in modern history, um, over a million people infected. Now they want to use it as a pretext for international intervention because of this COVID. There are all kinds of uh, mechanisms and tools to use to try to demonize the people, the 20 million people who live in isolation from the rest of the world. Historically, this is the same areas of Yemen that had remained independent of global capitalism for hundreds of years. They, they've insinuated that they're part of this Iranian coalition, which is basically impossible to supply anything to these guys in the north because the area is completely surrounded. There's no fuel. There's no medicines coming in. They've tried to starve them. They've tried to make them sick. To submission, but these people are resilient. They're now growing their own food again, even though the international world food program is not providing them good food. They've been complaining for years that the food that's being sent to them is already old. It's full of animals, and and so it's basically uh, you can't eat it. They've taken away the financial system, so it's it's a disaster. And yet, people have proven themselves they can live outside the 20th century. They don't need the 20th century to survive. They have 20th century military equipment. They keep adapting and they are resisting military, 21st century military equipment, 21st or 22nd military strategy, which is to invoke as much civilian pressure as possible, bring suffering to the people of northern Yemen. They're more than happy to see these uh, ter torrential rains lead to disasters that, that, uh, that over flood towns. There, have been, there was a cry out just yesterday please, we need uh, outside world to come and pay attention to the fact that many of our dams are being broken apart, they're being blown up, there are floods all over our fields that we, we're waiting for to use this period to eat for the next uh, harvest, that's all being washed out. 
which is a very cynical use of people's suffering and knowingly putting people in harm's way, which is a war crime, of course, which doesn't get reported though, right? The UN is not going to report it. No one in the UN is banging their fists and saying, what about those 20 million people in northern Yemen? You don't have anyone from, uh, from the media in the West saying anything about this. Even though there are offers for journalists to come, they will smuggle you in. You can see firsthand, and all you get is this vice, you know, or they report from somewhere in Aden, uh, and they, they basically give the, the narrative courtesy of Riyadh or Qatar of what's actually going on on the ground. Did they, did they launch a drone attack on one of the main oil producing parts of Saudi Arabia like about two years ago? Yes. Uh, ballistic missiles and drones. Um, they, they overwhelmed the air defense systems in, in, in both the eastern territories, but also this big complex just north of, of the border between northern Yemen and, and Saudi Arabia. And Riyadh has been hit several times with great accuracy. So they've, they've, they've hit things that they said they were going to hit, which is impressive. And they are able to take satellite footage from Google, right, from internet, and they've been able to show and, and show before and after pictures. So even though there would be denials in Western media that anything was hit, because that's a, that's a big factor. If and indeed for a while, half the Saudi production was had stopped. They had to, there was a big period. You can actually look at the price of uh, spike of prices and people in who trade oil in Zurich or elsewhere in the world know very well what's going on the ground. They have much better intelligence than sometimes even governments, and they know exactly what's going on, on the ground, and especially in, the, in, in Saudi Arabia itself. So infrastructure has been challenged, has been disrupted, and they demonstrated they can do it over. They, they, they bombed Jeddah. They burned down the newly built train station in Jeddah. They've been able to infiltrate deep into Saudi Arabia, and over the long term, they, they don't want to hurt civilians. That's the last thing they want to do is, is to – they think they have – civilians in Saudi Arabia's support, quiet support, right? And the, the government in Saudi Arabia is desperate to somehow balance the fact that they have to put economic pressure on everybody now. Everybody has to go to work in Saudi Arabia now. There are no longer, no longer domestic workers from Philippines. They've all been expelled. You now have Saudis serving coffee to each other. You have now a value-added taxes. The price of living in, in Saudi Arabia has gone up large amounts. The subsidies that once was given to families for new births or, you know, end of Ramadan, those things are gone now. And now with this COVID, this, you know, what, what role does this family play anymore if you can't even go on Hajj to, to celebrate your faith anymore? You can't go pray in mosques anymore. So all this is translating into big domestic political problems that could be exploited by rivals of Mohammed bin Salman inside the Saudi family, or as I suspect, you may end up having a fragmentation of the country itself as the family falls into despair. He arrested many cousins from leaving the country. He confiscated their bank accounts, but that's all been spent a long time ago. Trump has been very clear in saying that we're no longer subsidizing you guys. You're going to have to pay cash if you want weapons. And indeed, Sweden and other countries that used to sell, Canada has been screwed by the Saudis who hasn't paid for those weapons and those re relations have been cut. So right now they're desperate for cash and they're spending money that they don't have to pay for weapons, to fight a war which they can never win, to pay for mercenaries who could very easily turn around and join the other side. It's a mess and it's going to translate in the long term or I would say medium term into dramatically redrawing the borders of the Middle East, just like what happened to Libya, de facto to Iraq and Syria. You're going to see it translate also in the Arabian Peninsula. We don't know who's, what's going to come out. Turkey is going to try to take advantage of this, but they're also in financial <laughs> catastrophe awaiting. You see them uh, as rivals to in many theaters right now, whether it be in Libya or in southern, in Somalia, and it's maybe even in Yemen at some point. Issa, would you, would, I don't know if you have your book handy, but would you mind to wrap up reading the last paragraph in the last chapter? Page 200, the last paragraph of chapter 6 reads, The daily bombings mark yet again that what Yemenis around the world have known for decades now. Factions within the Saudi family and the empire it serves are incapable of human empathy. They resort to violence to obtain their objectives of economic, cultural, and political hegemony over Yemen and the larger Islamic world. The problem for empire is there are 
consequences to such acts. Wisely avoiding Yemen for much of the modern history of the region, the overreach we are witnessing today will prove to be a historic miscalculation. As the coalition of more than 10 nations fighting this war on behalf of empire already discovered, Yemenis will bend but not break. And more still, Yemenis will prove to be the deadliest unflagging enemy empire has ever known. And because Yemenis just will not succumb, this war will one day be the point to which empire forever changes and Saudi Arabia itself will disappear. For this, we owe it to Yemenis to honor the sacrifice of tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, who will die to save us from what is, in the end, our empire. On this episode, you heard the team tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.